Hello and welcome to this webinar on resuscitative endovascular occlusion of the aorta or RIBOA, which is brought to you by ESTES, the European Society for Trauma and Emergency Surgery. For this state-of-the-art session, we have nine experts from seven countries. David McGreevy and Talhora from Sweden, Mansour Khan from the UK, Jody Bose and Stefan Lechtel from the USA, Alfa Galili from Israel, Yanis Oslua from Turkey, Marcel Ribeiro from Brazil, and my co-host Carlos Yanis from Spain. There will be two case studies and four presentations, which is a lot to get through. We want to make this as interactive as possible, so please ask any questions as we go along through the Q&A button. We'll try to answer them during the webinar, either directly with a written reply or as part of the panel discussions. If there are a number of similar questions, we may answer them together. And if you ask a great question that we don't have time to answer during the webinar, we may send you a reply by email afterwards. I think the best thing to do is to get started with the first clinical case presentation, uh, which is going to be brought to us by David McGreevy from the Department of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery in Orebro in Sweden. So David, if you'd like to share your screen and give your presentation. Thank you very much. Let's see. Just let me know. You can, can you see my screen? I see your screen. So, there we go. Okay. Well, thank you very much for letting me speak here. Uh, so what I want to do is just to kick off this webinar by uh, explaining to you a case of the use of Reboa in pelvic trauma with pelvic or hemodynamic instability and no conflicts of interest. Uh, so this is a case of using Reboa in pelvic trauma using what we call the EVTN concept. So the case is, was a th presented to us in Örebro, was a 33-year-old male who had been uh, driving a motorcycle, uh, wearing a helmet, and uh, crashed with a car uh, that was standing still, high-speed collision. Uh, and unfortunate for him, medical personnel were already on the scene. There was actually a medical personnel that was involved in the crash. Um, uh, when the uh, patient arrived to the emergency room, he was complaining of pelvic pain. His airway was intact and his breathing sounds were normal with a normal saturation. And initially he had a normal, uh, normal circulation, normal blood pressure, uh, non-invasive though, with 140 millimeters of mercury and a normal pulse, powerful femoral pulse, carotid and radial. And what we do in Erdebrou using the EVTM concept is what we call the AABCDE procedure. We always place in patients, even if they're not hemodynamically unstable, we always place a vascular axis in the femoral arteries. In this case, we used ultrasound and placed the five French introducer in the right femoral artery. Because this will be able, well, I'll, show you, I'll show you later why we do this. Um, the patient, uh, the FAST was initially negative, uh, but we could uh, palpate an unstable uh, pelvis uh, and therefore the patient received a pelvic binder and he had multiple extremity fractures. So the initial uh, decision was to take the patient to CT as he was uh, uh, hemodynamically stable. However, just leaving the emergency room, he became un hemodynamically unstable and his uh, blood pressure very quickly decreased to 70 over 40. And therefore, the decision was made by the trauma surgeon to take the patient uh, straight to the OR. Uh, upon arrival to the, emergent, uh, to the operating room, we upgraded uh, the introducer then to an eight French introducer. And this is why we always place uh, initially five French introducers because upgrading pay, uh, to an eight French introducer is much easier to do than having to puncture on a hemodynamically unstable patient. Uh, we initially placed the Reboa, an ER Reboa in zone one with total occlusion to elevate the patient's blood pressure. And we always try to target what we call permissive hypertension, so 90 millimeters of uh, mercury. Uh, and uh, the laparotomy was initiated by the trauma surgeon, finding free blood in the pelvis. <clears throat> so coming to going back to Reboa, which is what we're uh, focusing on today, is uh, we initially started then with total occlusion of the aorta in zone one. Uh, we started with, uh, well, we continued this for 17 minutes because the patient uh, had uh, bled, uh, bled out quite significantly. Uh, and this was done then with simultaneous blood transfusions by the anesthetists, so giving them time to catch up uh, on the blood loss. 
Uh, when the patient was starting to become more hemoglobinically stable, uh, we then moved the Reboa down to zone three as the uh, trauma surgeons had found that the bleeding was mostly coming from this uh, unstable pelvic fracture. Uh, and we did this uh, un because we didn't want the patient to crash while moving the balloon down. What we did is we did this under manual compression of the aorta. So using a uh, thumb just to press down the aorta while we move the balloon down. And we continued then with partial occlusion in the zone three for 28 minutes. And also here then trying to target permissive hypertension. Um, and this is also what, what we call EVTM. So it's EVTM stands for using both endovascular and uh, open surgical procedures simultaneously. So what we did at the same time while also doing Reboa and uh, laparotomy and pelvic packing was to uh, place a seventh French introducer on the left side using ultrasound guidance and at the same time trying to do an angiography uh, to see if we have any uh, obvious bleeding from the aorta or from the iliac arteries. Um, one of the we, we firstly we did the the um, uh, the angiography. This was possible because we had partial occlusion, so you have some blood flow past the Reboa. Uh, but we were having problems uh, seeing the right iliac artery because of the eight French introducer and the on the right side. And therefore, what we did is that we tried to do go crossover. Finding this difficult, what we did is we actually blowed, we, we inflated the balloon to total occlusion in the distal part of the aorta and using the Reboa to guide the catheter, the angiography catheter over into the right side uh, iliac artery to then be able to do a proper angiography of the right iliac artery. Uh, and we therefore then didn't see any obvious um, uh, actualization. Uh, the patient were then during this time that was was um, pelvic packing was uh, performed. We didn't find any obvious intestinal or organ uh, injuries uh, because of the open book pelvic fraction. Xfix uh, was uh, placed and also two sacroiliac screws, uh, and the patient received uh, quite a lot of transfusion during uh, uh, this procedure and also fibrinogen and uh, TXA. Um, <clears throat> After this, the patient uh, was hemodynamically stable, and we therefore then decided to take the patient to the CT uh, to see if we can find uh, if, if the only, the only uh, obvious uh, sources of bleeding was from the pelvic fracture, if there was anything else that we had missed. Uh, we decided to remove uh, the eight French introducer uh, at that time and placing angio seal, but we left the seventh French introducer in place on the left side. Uh, this because if the patient had become hemodynamically unstable uh, during the CT or when uh, they took, if they taken when they're going to take the patient back for a second look, um, uh, you, then you already have an access to be able to place a Reboa again. So and during that time, we used the the, uh, the seventh French introducer as an arterial line. So this is what we call the EVTM concept, using uh, both open and endovascular procedures simultaneously in the OR to treat the patient and uh, save their lives. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, David, for that case presentation. Any of the panelists like to comment on that, other than what looks like a very good result from a combined approach of multimodalities? I'd like to just emphasize the initial point, the initial procedure of putting a sheath in the patient, which seems stable, more than stable at the beginning. But that's, I think, that what made the difference here in this case, that we were able to have, have an arterial access at the beginning and not fight with trying to get an access when the patient has a 70 or 60 millimeter of mercury and vasospasm, and you'll spend 15, 20 minutes just to access the artery, and then you might lose the patient. So I think the initial decision to put an access at the beginning, right when you see the patient, when you understand this is, he looks stable now, he may be unstable in a few minutes, put the access. Yeah, I, I, would, I would also like to highlight, I think it was a great case, David, uh, a very important point that I think uh, you mentioned is when you move the Reboa down from zone one to zone three, to have that manual compression, because uh, if, if not, if you just move it or you deflate it, 
uh, quickly, you can have a, a the patient can crash on you. So I think that was a really, really mm -hmm. nice maneuver that, that reflects the, the expertise that you have down in Oribru. Yeah, this was, I mean, fortunately, this was a, a, a young patient, but sometimes you might find patients have, for example, very uh, atherosclerotic arteries. And therefore, when while moving the balloon down, you can damage the balloon. So to not uh, to have any uh, un you know events that you, when you're trying to inflate it again, it's not inflating properly. You already have that manual compression and keeping the patient stable. Yeah, th this was really nicely done, and I think a great way of using Reboa for the pelvis injury. I'm always hesitant if the fast exam is positive, then I'd rather just go into the belly directly. What I'm just wondering of the panelists outside of Orobro, how many would have done Reboa? versus preperitoneal packing, and then gone into the belly to rule out if there's any other injury in the abdomen that needs to be treated, which looking back since the angiography didn't do much since it wasn't an arterial injury, I guess would have probably in retrospect been faster to just do the preperitoneal packing and um, stay in the OR. If you have the capability the way you have it with a sheath in place, the hybrid OR that of course is great, I know that would have been a little bit more of a delay here at my institution to uh, go to the OR, do the X lab, then go to the IR suite, um, do things there, and then move back to the OR. Yes, Stefan, uh, sorry, I'll just interject on that one. I think that's a very, very good question. In the multiple years I worked at St. Mary's in London, major trauma center, I think there was one preperitoneal packing done in that entire duration. We did exactly what you did, go in there, do the X lab, you then pack the patient, send them down to IR, and then get intervention done that way. So much like what you've said, that's what our practice was in the Northwest area of London, where we saw about three, three and a half thousand trauma cases a year. And the vast majority of those were blunt MVCs. And even with the high grade pelvic fractures, as I said, that's, that's what we did. Okay, and a question. Uh, I know that just a little short comment here in Brazil, in my institution would be probably easier and faster for us to prepare it on your pack in the patient uh, and get the orthopedics to, uh, to get the pelvic stable. And then uh, as needed, if we have a negative fest, then move forward for interventional radiology or something like that. It would be like, I think we are a lot more used to do it this way. It's like a little bit faster for us. So that's the way we should try to do in this case. I think this is probably a very good time to ask the audience about their experience of Reboa. Um, so it's a little poll for you. Um, in your own hospital, do you use Reboa? Is Reboa used by other people, but not by you? Or is Reboa not used at all? Okay, so most people have voted. And about 20% use Reboa. 10% is used by others. So in 30% of the, the, uh, the uh, audience, it's used within their hospital. And for about 70%, Reboa is not used. So uh, that's an interesting... Uh, uh, interesting demographic, but probably a little bit more people using than I thought. Okay, shall we move on to Mansur Khan and your presentation? Um, if you want to share your screen. Um, this Mansur is a, a consultant general upper GI and trauma surgeon from Brighton and Sussex, and uh, he's going to talk on the EVTM philosophy and the management of trauma. I've unmuted myself so we can start. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for the opportunity to talk. And um, all my talk is going to be is a is an overview of what I believe the EVTM philosophy is. So if we, these views are my own and don't represent any organizations or any affiliations. So take them with a pinch of salt or take them as gospel, whichever way you decide. I am quite controversial at the best of times, although I don't think on this occasion I am, because what I'm going to be trying to tell you is a lot of common sense. But unfortunately, I was told many, many years ago, and every day it gets reinforced that common sense is, in fact, not very common. So just try and think with an open mind. A lot of trauma management can be read about in books. There is very little level one evidence in trauma, just purely because of the populace, the amount of work it takes to set up a level one trial, and also the amount of work coming in to make it all viable. 
And as I said, common sense is free, but it's not widely available. So I'll just give you that as a skeletal framework to hang stuff off. So what are the current Procroma priorities? Our current ones, if you base this on management of the acutely unwell patient based on the CABCD paradigm is to control catastrophic hemorrhage first. In the limbs, you can do this by tourniquets. In the torso, it's what we class as non-compressible torso hemorrhage. So there is no real point continuing on and evaluating A, B, C, D if you haven't got control of the big C because you'll have nothing to circulate the oxygen molecule around your system. Hypothermia, acidosis, coagulopathy, hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia. Those are my six core things which I try and address in anybody with major trauma and hemorrhagic shock. Goes on to the next slide of no one should die from hemorrhage. So what do we do currently? If you were to come to me in a state of major hemorrhage, what would I do? Well, I would do extraluminal clamping. I'd open up the appropriate cavity and put on a vascular clamp or my fist and try and compress the actual inflow of blood to the region that is bleeding. So the anesthesiologist, the anesthetist can catch up with blood because there is no point pouring blood in if blood is pouring out. And as everyone knows, for every unit of blood you transfuse somebody in the first 24 hours, you independently increase their risk of dying. So only give them what they require. And in order to give them what they require, you need to actually turn off the tap. So we do that currently via extraluminal clamping. So what are we proposing? What we're saying is, why put the clamp on the outside of the vessel when you can put it on the inside? Make a smaller hole, be less debilitating. If you have major vascular injury, because face it, the vast majority of patients who have got hemorrhage have some degree of vascular injury occurring. We can repair the vessel, we can shunt the vessel, or we can ligate the vessel. These are all standard operative practices in management of the major trauma patient. And these can be rapidly done by trained individuals. You don't want somebody who's never done it doing this for the first time, because it's not just the surgical approach, it's the speed of the approach and the decision-making that goes on whilst doing this. And that can only be obtained by being taught the right way to start off with, and then lots of exposure. So repair, this is what we can do. You've got a partial tear. If the patient's physiology allows, you can actually repair the vessel. And remember, all interventions in trauma are physiology dependent. You can shunt the patient. So take, for example, you have a femoral artery and a femoral vein injury. You can shunt the patient if they are not physiologically well enough to get definitive repair. And remember, shunt the vein and the artery. Increased chances of limb salvage and organ salvage if you sh um, shunt both the vessels. And then finally, in extremis, ligate the vessel, okay? Remember, you can ligate every single vessel in the body. You just have to be able to deal with the consequences. Some of them can be catastrophic, but yet again, if the patient is dying in front of you, you have to try and stop that bleed. So how can this be achieved? Oh, sorry, can this be achieved with EVTM? Yes, it can. In appropriately selected cases. What you have to be wary of is this requires a number of prerequisites to be met. This isn't just for any person to pick up and say, I'm going to start doing this by myself. So what you required is a trained team. You need to do this day in, day out, drill it day in, day out, so everything is slick. Remember, the trauma patient is that person who is dying in front of you, and all interventions are time critical. They'll give you one chance. They won't give you a second chance, so you have to make this count. You need the infrastructure in place, and what I mean by the infrastructure is, yet again, with the team, you need the resources, you need the right radiographic equipment, you need the right catheters, you need the right Reboa equipment, whatever you require, infrastructure is both manpower and resources you need to have in place. Who does it? Simple answer is the person who is trained to do it. That is it. You need to be trained in doing this. You need to be trained in managing the trauma patient, but you need to know what the consequences of your actions are going to be so you can anticipate them and mitigate against them. 
So what can we do? Instead of repairing a vessel, there are covered stents available. In the good old days, they used to be very, very rigid and could not go across joints. But nowadays, they're actually quite flexible. You can put them across a joint and they're a great, either a definitive or a temporizing measure to get you out of a hole. You can potentially shunt if you can get that guide wire across a quite significantly lacerated vessel. Yet again, with the same things that I've discussed before, or you could ligate the vessel by throwing in coils. Take, for example, you have a major splenic injury who has occurred and the interventional radiologist or the endovascular surgeon has actually just dropped coils in for you on the splenic artery. Obviously, you got back bleeding from the short gastrics, but it buys you time to get that person to the OR if that was not previously possible. What are we limited by? Vision. OK, without vision, you can't make advances. So you need to be doing the most appropriate thing to advance your department, your service, both in terms of infrastructure and in training. Ambition goes more or less with vision. OK, if you don't have the ambition to improve, you're never going to get there. And also the technology. This is evolving day in, week in, month in. Every single time I open up the literature, something new is occurring, which we can use in certain selected cases for management of trauma patients. And key thing to remember is EVTM is a system technique and is not an individual. It is a team, it is infrastructure, and it is the willingness to undertake this in the selected patients for which it is warranted. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mansour. Do we have any comments on the panel on that uh, great presentation? Uh, thank you for this great presentation. Uh, about uh, mentioning the uh, trained team, uh, what do you mean uh, by a trained team? Who must be in this team? Who else is in your team, in your institution? So in this, in the great question, thank you very much for that, Yanis. Um, you have, first of all, depending on where the robot is being deployed, you could have the pre-hospital providers putting it in. You have the emergency department physicians. You have the nursing staff. You have the intensive care anesthetists. You also have, if the individual isn't a vascular surgeon, by training vascular surgeons on standby. Because as everybody knows here, when you deploy a Reboa catheter in the femoral artery, you've got a clot to potentially pick up downstream. So you need to have individuals. And it's just that mindset of having the right trained individuals around you, which can manage the patient optimally. So nothing is missed. Because any intervention we do to the patient will carry a morbidity. We need to mitigate that morbidity. And that's why we require this wider range critical care physicians, so they can monitor the foot afterwards as well. Same with the vascular team. That's it. It's just everybody involved in it. That's wonderful. If I may, man, so one um, comment. When you use the word trained uh, staff, trained personnel, it's not only trained in their skills, in their hands, knowing how to put a sheath in and know how to deploy no, no, no. It's trained in their state of mind. They need to think EVTM, think about the concept. Once you think, every action starts with the state of mind. If the state of mind of the team is endovascular, then you are able to move forward. With this. Yep, totally agree, Arthur. Totally agree. The trained part isn't just the technical aspects. It's all the non-technical skills. Yes. I, I, I just want to highlight, I, I think it's a great presentation and, and comments uh, about the system. Because uh, one of the things I, I think we must train, and we don't do as much here in Spain, is uh, to train for a uh, crisis and train teamwork and communication. It's not only the technical skills, but you have to have swift communication between the pre-hospital, the emergency room, the OR and interventional radiology. And sometimes that's difficult in, in day, but it's even more challenging at two or three in the morning. So, so you have to, to have to, uh, 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 people that are really uh, motivated to, to make this work and, and really get the machine uh, moving adequately. 
thanks for the presentation. I, I completely agree. And I didn't see anything controversial in there, even though I'm more on the open side, I think, than endovascular. But I do have one kind of maybe more technical question. What do you think about putting stents in a lot of trauma patients that might not follow up, might not get surveillance CT scans, they may not be compliant or afford their antiplatelet medication. So do you see any concern? We're putting covered stents in, you know, 21 year olds with, let's say, a subclavian axillary artery injury. What's going to happen to that stent without aspirin and, you know, five years, 10 years later without follow up? Is, is that potentially a problem? Thanks, Stefan. I think that is a, definitely a great question. And we found this for a lot of the individuals who say, for example, come in with solid organ injuries. You have somebody with a grade four spleen or a grade four liver, which you've managed with angiographical intervention. And dogma dictates that you scan them a couple of weeks, six weeks down the line to see if there's any pseudo aneurysms available. I think do the best you can for the patient at that time. And as I said, with the stint, uh, stent, it may just be a bridging measure until you can get more definitive treatment done. But if they are going to have a stent put in for a prolonged period of time, well, you know, that's where the counseling comes in. That's where you discuss with the patient, explain to them what's going to happen if they don't do it. And it is a partnership. You can, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And what you're dealing with at the patient at that moment in time is somebody who's potentially going to die. You can make them survive. Whether they want to live after that, and I hate to be blunt, is just as much as their responsibility as it is yours. Uh, Stefan, this is Joe DeBose. I think we have the same argument about even managing bowel injuries, right? Whether you bring a colostomy up or put the bowel back together may have different things you would want to follow. Or um, The patients will do what they do. It doesn't mean that you don't do what you think is best for the patient that's sitting in front of you. You can't worry about their uh, follow-up um, piece. Uh, it's a concern, but uh, it's going to be a concern for all of them. Good point. Certainly true for many injuries and uh, and importance of, of follow up and care coordination. OK, I think now we're talking about com complications. It'll be a good time to move on to the next presenter, which is Tal Hora, who's going to tell us how to reduce complications and mortality in patients with Ruboa. <clears throat> I hope you can see it. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here, Estas and the committee that organized it, and uh, Carlos and Jonathan. Thank you very much. I will try in a very intensive uh, time window to show quite a lot of photos, videos. I will try my best that it will be visible and good. But um, <clears throat> we want to do something interesting with the Reboa. This is Reboa in real time in, in our trauma bay. We are not a, a big a trauma center like, a, for example, Joe Dubois Center. You cannot, of course, look at these volumes that you have in the same way. And apropos this, of course, if you speak about the time of surgery, we're of course slower than someone who has huge volumes. <clears throat> this is how Ribor looks, and this is the case that, uh, that I think this is the case or another case that uh, uh, David spoke about. And this is a real life Ribor in a pelvic bleeding. And you can see it's being used. It's used clinically now more and more and more centers, different balloons we have three kinds of balloons we are using, not only in trauma. This is the rebot to go kit that we have, and we describe this and more with our colleagues on top stand that will come. It, this is the Spanish edition. It's available in different languages. And we're speaking about the balloon used in different locations, but it's not only the balloon. I will come back to this. This is the rebot registry, the ABO trauma registry, the parallel American, a bit bigger, I have to admit, uh, Dr. Dubois uh, registry is parallel. And if you want to join, it's easy, easy to join, get cases in and cooperate on this issue. When we talk about Reboa in our centers, we learned a lot from the ruptured aneurysm around 20 years back. And we used it a lot in ruptures. The ruptures, by the way, are now decreasing, but they're coming uh, at times. We learned a lot from the ruptures, how to deal with the balloons uh, as a bridge to, to do something, to operate. Now the catheters today are different. We're using six, seven, eight French. And we have today more data on Reboa and more data on how to do things that we didn't have back then. And we learned it the hard way. This is a patient that have also ischemia, reperfusion, abdominal compartment syndrome, and much more. So I think today we know quite a lot about Reboa in bleeders. But Reboa is just a balloon. It's quite amazing how many controversies there are around this balloon. It's just one tool that has to be used on the correct patient, correct indication. Then this we can discuss for hours. 
correct manner. And part of the toolbox, we call it the EVTM, the endovascular resuscitation and trauma management. And it's not risk-free and you must, you must have a strategy. <clears throat> and I would ask a question or put it up like this. Is it a minimal invasive method? Maybe it's a, in, a minimal invasive method, but the consequences might be quite invasive. I will come back to it. So Reboa is your noradrenaline or internal noradrenaline, or if I can call it like this. What the aim is, as we know, is to temporarily get a better blood pressure and perfusion to the heart and the uh, brain, but this does not stop bleeding. And it's just one, as the one of the two, but it's never a solution. So someone that never did it has to understand, Reboa is not a solution, it's just a tool and you, have to use it in the correct way. I will go back to the partial Reboa, which I think the optimal way to use it if possible in trauma and non-trauma and part of the EVTM concept. <clears throat> if you, you see the schematic illustration on my right side, you would see that when you use the balloon, we block the flow to the whole lower body part, which means it would be an excessive ischemia and ischemia reperfusion later on with acidosis, hyperlactemia, hyperkalemia, and much more abdominal compartment syndrome, leg ischemia, leg ischemia, et cetera. So we will speak shortly about different things you can do to do things better. And this is the access issues, when to use indications, I will touch very shortly, how to use when you leave the Rebo in place, when you use intermittent Rebo or partial Rebo, and very importantly, and I think this was missed in many, many cases in the last years, is the post-Reboa care. And again, I'm coming back to this comment, is it so minimally invasive? So we prefer to do the access by ultrasound. We've been done also by cut down, but in our hands, uh, ultrasound is the preferred method. It's the safest method, one puncture, not too high. Uh, do it, hold the introducer, hold your Reboa and take care of the access. This is how it looks in a real case. This is the case from yesterday with the postpartum bleeding. And you see, you have to take care of this access and you have to take good care of it. Access can be gained even under CPR, a non-stable patient or ongoing CPR. This is published and verified. And we have cases, of course, we have cases we failed, but you can do a vascular access. You can do it, of course, by op open exposure. The question is, will the patient benefit from the Reboa? And this is the major step to, to get better results and avoid complication. Does my patient need Reboa? And if he needs Reboa, why? And what is the next step? Why, what do I plan? What's the, what's the strategy? What's plan B? This is, by the way, intrathoracic bleed, bleeding came while CPR, no, no pressure and he managed with CPR, massive transfusion, Reboa, et cetera, and other endovascular techniques, subclavia, he is at home. The question is, why do you need Reboa? Does your team need Reboa? And not maybe what another center would do. What, you, what is best in your place? And what's your surgical solution? What's the plan B? And the reason very simple, because Reboa does not stop bleeding. It might decrease bleeding, but this is an example of extravasation when you have the Reboa in place. There is back bleeding, of course. This is what happened in an animal model when you see a total occlusion in an animal model is said, when you have long occlusion, your arterial pH goes down, the more time, the more pH acidity. Lactate is going up, more time, more uh, lactemia, hyperlactemia. And organ damage and itolokins, uh, everything points at the lowest time of Reboa is the best. Partial occlusion, this is uh, the first case published and this is how it looks in reality. This was an old bal balloon that we used back in times. And this is how you can control the pressure of the patient with the Reboa while partially occluding the aorta. And Joe Dubos, Professor Dubos published on this many interesting articles. It's worth to go into it in details. But what I wanna say is, of course, if you use no Reboa in an animal model, or partial Reboa, you gain some time, you hold the patient. And of course, with an, in an animal model, on a total Reboa, you gain more time. But there is price to pay for total occlusion of the aorta. And this we showed in a study that showed that blood pressure targeting, but partial Reboa is possible even in severe hemorrhage in a 
pig uh, in the animal model, and you can get less circulatory metabolic and inflammatory sequelae from uh, using uh, versus total ribo. This is how can, it can look in reality. It can look in different ways. They are now coming a, a partial ribo, a, a specified partial ribo catheter. It's coming to the market, but you can do your own partial ribo with your hands or another syringe. The idea is to aim as partial as possible. Short occlusion time, monitor your pressure above and below the balloon, titrate the systolic blood pressure as much as you can, even follow the end tidal CO2. You can know what's the metabolic status and move of course to zone three if possible. <clears throat> this is a study we did together with the American group and uh, Dr. Duchense, Professor Duchense, and we looked at uh, the definition of responder. And we believe that if you do not respond to Reboa, then your probability to die is higher. And this is shown in this study you can read. We, we looked at different parameters, but I would say like this in a short way, if you don't get to respond to Reboa, either your patient is dead, there is no cardiac output, or you're in the wrong place, or the balloon ruptures. You also should evaluate what happens if you have tamponade, but you have to move on to another solution. Something is wrong. It's impossible physiologically that if you get the Bribo in the correct place, the blood pressure does not go up. This is just an example how a wire can go to the wrong place in, a, in the iliac, so you have to know where you are. And of course, to avoid complication. It's not over until it's over. You, have, you, you can have massive complications from your access, from the riboa, maybe fasciotomy that needs to be done, tromb as you see here. So you have to avoid and take care of the access. This is how you see when you, it looks when you take out one of the patient, one of the riboa, you take it out, you have to take care of it. You have to take care of your introducer. You have to continue working and see what's going on. Sorry. And, I will try to get back to it. Okay, doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, and this is how can you one way to remove and use, as uh, David mentioned, the angio seal. You have to see that you don't don't get any bleeding, any problems. You have to take care of the access. Maybe completion control of uh, angiography. Maybe do ultrasound. You have to know what you're doing. So to reduce complication and mortality, you have to use to pick the correct patient to handle the access correctly and early, we believe in very early access, Rebo is only as a bridge and part of a concept. Hold the Rebo at all times, communicate with your anesthesiologist and the team, partial and intermediate preferably, zone three of course if possible, closure device, it depends on the patient what you can do, confirm that the access site is, is okay, do, do ultrasound and take care of the metabolic insult in the ICU abdominal compartment syndrome, acidosis, respiratory problems, etc. We'll try to discuss this in a workshop we will do here, virtual, virtual workshop on the 25th of September. We're dealing uh, with it on the JVTM and we're uh, going to the next edition in October. And I would like to thank again uh, everybody for the support and we hope to meet in Sweden in June if it will be possible. Again, thank you for the European Society of Trauma and for the the Estes committees, uh, Carlos, Jonathan, and the rest of the panelists. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tal, for that great uh, presentation. Do you have any comments, panel? Yes, uh, uh, Tal, uh, uh, that's a great presentation. Uh, of course, I, I, I really like how you highlight the importance of the ischemic burden and, and the, that time that we try to limit the, the ischemia with a partial reboa. I think, that's, I think that's the path that we're going to try to follow. And I think Joseph also is an expert on this. So I'd like to have, since I have both of you, uh, I know that you're both aware of the new catheter, the uh, Reboa Pro, that's going to make things easier with uh, this decompression valve, avoiding uh, overinflation of the balloons. But if you have the conventional uh, technology that uh, most of us are going to be using for a while, uh, what do you think is the best way to monitor this distal uh, partial reboa? Is it with distal pressure or is it distal uh, blood pressure to proximal blood pressure ratio or a mean arterial distal pressure? So oh, that's important. Maybe then uh, Professor Dubos wants to answer. We always try to do a bilateral uh, arterial puncture. So you have also control. The other, I, I'm always using or we are using 
eight French and not seven French, because we believe then you can have more control of the pressure down uh, and, and you can know more what's going on if it's partial or total occlusion. We're looking at the systolic pressure mainly, but the mean arterial pressure is extremely important uh, also. Uh, this can be debated. I don't know if uh, Joe Dubos have any comments on this. I'm aware of the new catheter. I've never used it yet, so I would love to, to try it. Yeah, the pro catheter is coming in, and that may change practice a bit, but at present we utilize the, uh, the Pritime ER Reboa device, and I do advocate for getting some form of, of arterial line monitoring above and below. I, I use the side port of the sheath that is used to introduce the balloon, and I make, ask our anesthesiologist to put two wave forms up so we can see what the pressures are above and below. I find systolics just are easier for the trauma surgeons and the anesthesiologist to all understand, see, and visualize quickly. Uh, and I'll show some pictures of that in my talk here to follow. Uh, but it's, it's all about rehearsing what you're going to be doing and uh, having those lines consistently in the same place. And I think if you're going to give emphasis, it's to the pressure above the balloon, because really the critical organs to perfuse are the brain and the heart. And that number, keeping that number for me above 90, if, we don't, if they will tolerate, is ideal. And then whatever I can get flow distally and still maintain 90, I'll take as long as it's not making the bleeding worse. Okay, now you've trailed your presentation. You might as well start with it if you'd like to do your case. Yes, I shall. That'll be great. Let me get it up to the big screen here. I hope that that's visible to everyone. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to flow very quickly from a case presentation actually into my talk about Reboa complications. So this is, uh, as opposed to some of the blunt trauma that Tall's used to seeing, I, I have a lot of people who have a tendency to go to church at, on Saturday nights or, or minding their own business and suddenly are randomly shot in the city of Baltimore. And this is one of those, he's a 26-year-old male, sustained multiple gunshot wounds, uh, the left upper quadrant and the left flank. He came to us, he was GCS 15 and his blood pressure was 85 over 30. This is not his FAST exam, but uh, it's an illustration of a positive FAST exam, which he did have, and his was more impressive than the one that is shown on the screen. He also had on chest x-ray a left hemothorax. We placed a left thoracostomy tube and got about 400 cc's of blood, which tapered off very quickly. As per our practice, we established a right common femoral arterial line. In this case, our ultrasound was not functioning, so we performed a rapid cut down for placement of initial five French sheath, which was then upsized to a seven. And we uh, uh, authorized emergency release blood and gave him two units of blood. However, his blood pressure was moving in the wrong direction, even with resuscitation via large bore lines. So he fell per our, cat, our protocol, which is here on the left, uh, into that category of non or partial responder with a positive FAST exam. And so we put, elected to place his own uh, balloon into zone one. Uh, again, this is not his film, but this does illustrate what we did in this case, which was uh, obtain a subsequent plane film confirming positioning of the Reboa device within zone one, and then subsequently inflated it with a very nice response in blood pressure to 120 millimeters above the balloon. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the full natural history of his balloon, but we transitioned to partial occlusion after eight minutes after establishing access and getting more units of blood hanging so that we were sure that we were staying ahead of the resuscitative process. We took him to, uh, got him very quickly to the emergency room and rapidly opened his abdomen, found moderate hemoperitoneum, a, a essentially shattered spleen, which underwent splenectomy. He had gastir, uh, gastric anterior and posterior injuries and a diaphragm repair, which were all undertaken. He did have some kind of annoying uh, output from his chest tube, so we elected to perform an anterior lateral thoracotomy and found uh, uh, mainly bleeding from intercostals, which were controlled with ligation, although we did wedge out a small section of his left lower lobe uh, due to some kind of annoying type of ooze from the lower pressure uh, tracks there. This is the actual picture of the case as we were nearing completion. We now had hemostasis and we're cleaning things up. You can see the Reboa is now in place prior to removal. Our full occlusion time for Reboa in this particular instance, and again, we use the Pritime ER Reboa device. I'm not affiliated with the company. I have no conflicts with uh, this, but this is the device that we utilize primarily at our centers here in the United States. We um, utilize that to facilitate ongoing resuscitation and transition to partial occlusion after a dura uh, for a duration of total partial occlusion time of only 20 minutes. So a very short period of time in this patient. On completion, he had no pressors. He had a final estimated blood loss of 3,500 cc's. And as you can see, we really did have to give him some significant resuscitation in the very early phases of this with 10 units of pack cells, including uh, FFP, platelets, transexamic acid as well. Initially post-operative, uh, he was sent to the unit with the seven French sheath in place. The Roboa was removed. 
he was extubated post-op day one, which ended up being actually, it, it says post-op day one, we finished in the late hours of one morning and he, he was uh, extubated the early hours of the next. Uh, however, Doppler signals were altered on the right side, which the sheath had been on. We ordered an emergent duplex and found that he had a right superficial femoral artery occlusion. However, he did have some flow around that. We took him back to for an angiogram, and as you can see here, there's our staples from our cut down. Uh, there on the superficial femoral artery, he has an occlusion which reconstitutes distally. We were able to open this up with an um, endovascular thromboembolism uh, device and restore patency to his leg. And he actually did quite well. He was extubated the following day. He did require some DV, uh, heparin for uh, DVT, but ate, had his chest tubes removed, and was discharged to home on Coumadin for the DVT on post-op day 14. So th that's obviously a thromboembolic complication of the leg resulting from Reboa. Let's talk about complications of Reboa in general briefly and how they can be um, considered and, and categorized. So obviously Reboa, if you think about how Reboa can be utilized and in what areas, one of the most useful ways for me to think about coherently about Reboa complications is to think about the steps that Reboa uh, is, is required for Reboa and where those, act, those complications can occur. And I think all these are essentially predictable and for the most part avoidable, but certainly all predictable. Uh, there's access related complications, balloon positioning and inflation issues, occlusion time and reperfusion issues, and uh, sheath mismanagement complications. Beginning with the access complications, we all know that if you access too low, obviously you're sticking this into a smaller diameter vessel and you increase the risk of subsequent thromboembolic events. If you access too high, now you introduce the, concept, the potential for retroperitoneal hematomas and potentially even bowel injury at extremes. Uh, so you want to really aim for that common femoral artery, and that is the key, in my opinion, to optimal utilization of Reboa. Um, and I think it's important to understand both the bony landmarks and, um, and to utilize ultrasound whenever possible. I think when people, uh, the natural tendency for trauma surgeons who do not work in the common femoral artery uh, area very as frequently is to place these monitoring lines too low below the skin crease. And they really need to understand that it's the bony, palpable bony landmarks that establish the inguinal ligament location <clears throat> and below that subsequently the common femoral. So that's one of the biggest education points that I find in teaching trauma surgeons in the U.S. how to effectively access. Of course, all this is mitigated, in my opinion, with utilization of ultrasound when possible. There's certainly some safe uh, other ways to utilize uh, anatomic landmarks, even fluoroscopy to access, but I, I, in my practice and in teaching, I utilize and advocate for ultrasound utilization to provide the most rapid and um, precise access to the common femoral artery when possible. Of course, it's not always possible. Uh, sometimes the, there's an actively coding patient. It's very challenging to get a neater, needle into a several millimeter vessel um, when active body compressions uh, and, or ultrasound is not available or even surgeon comfort level. And for that reason, we do need to have as a skill set the ability to do common femoral artery exposure, at least to identify the anterior aspect, which is what I go to uh, in every case in which active CPR is ongoing currently. The next phase that can uh, see complications is balloon positioning and inflation. We obviously have two zones that we primarily utilize, zone one above the paravisceral segment and zone three for pelvic bleeding. Um, ultrasound uh, ends up being a very important part of establishing where and pelvic plane film uh, to establish whether it's zone one or zone three is the most likely to be useful in the applications for BOA when they're employed. And you can obviously position these by a variety of different techniques. I personally utilize, and it's taught by the American College of Surgeons uh, Basic Intervascular Skills for Trauma Course, the utilization of external landmarks. But others have shown very effectively that prescribed distances can be utilized. And of course, plain radiography, whenever possible, should always be utilized to support adequate positioning. These are just two videos showing from the best course, uh, showing how we position the pry time device, which is what we utilize uh, primarily with the curly Q-tip at the sternal notch. Uh, for zone one deployment and at the xiphoid process for zone three deployment. And of course, measured differences, distances can also effectively be utilized. There's several European uh, uh, descriptions of this technique. Most recently in the US, uh, American Journal of Surgery in 2020 published that 45 centimeters for zone one and 28.5 centimeters for zone three will consistently deliver you to the zone one and zone three of the aorta. Uh, per the modern devices. And of course, whenever possible, utilizing plain radiography prior to inflation to ensure adequate positioning is always advocated. Now here's what can go wrong. And these are where the complications can occur with positioning 
A lot of these occurred with the prior, the, the current prior time device that we utilize in the US is a wire free system that has now transitioned the night and all wire into the actual device itself to provide for reinforcement. But with previous placement of wires using the older coder systems, wherever the wire went, the Verboa balloon went as well. And those could go up and over the, uh, to the other contralateral limb as shown on the left or even up into the carotid when you get particularly excited on the right. Here's some other cases on the left of uh, placed in the ascending aorta, just placed in simply too far. And on the right, a particularly gifted placement uh, up the uh, ipsilateral hypogastric, which, which has occurred in, in placing the balloon over the wire. And of course, you need to maintain one's position, always maintain knowing where that position is. This balloon was actually infl inserted to zone three, but then during patient manipulation and insufflation, desufflation, pulled back into uh, zone uh, into the iliac and inflated and subsequently uh, caused this injury that is seen. This was repaired endovascularly, but what could have potentially been avoided because of uh, losing track of the balloon position during utilization. So what, the next phase is essentially uh, the reperfusion uh, and ischemia issue. And one of the ways we can avoid this is by moving quickly uh, to locations where you can achieve definitive hemorrhage control. The aorta is occluded and we need to remember that and be mindful of that. The specific times that are danger zones for uh, ultimate occlusion, the, a variety of different sources have used 30 minutes for zone one and 60 minutes for zone three. This continues to be an area of aggressive study and is obviously influenced by a number of different factors, including burden of hemorrhage, antecedent to balloon placement, and as well as adequacy of additional resuscitation. And for that reason, we continue to study this aggressively. I am an advocate and, and huge proponent for partial Reboa. The concepts of this, you can get very, uh, deep into the weeds, but I do think the basic tenets of maintaining uh, optimal perfusion to the heart and brain, which have the lowest ischemic threshold, uh, and maintaining some distal perfusion to those organs below the balloon in a zone one position is what, uh, creating a hypotensive resuscitative state is really the ideal if you want to simplify this. It does take, absolutely takes, pre, you cannot do this uh, off the cuff, it needs to be premeditated. You have equipment requirements, including two A-line bags and arterial tracings. You can see here in the bottom right-hand screen, that red line is above the balloon. The white line is below the balloon in the early phases of one of our operative cases. If everyone understands what those numbers mean, anesthesiology can continue to resuscitate, the surgeons can work, as well as whoever's managing the balloon, all in concerted effort to optimize outcomes. And finally, getting to the case that we uh, outlined here, sheath mismanagement is actually the most common etiology of complications in the AAST aorta database. For that reason, and there's a lot of reasons why this occurs, systemic heparinization is typically contraindicated. You're dealing with small vessels, which are vasoconstricted in response to hemorrhage. And as opposed to heparinization, which we would utilize for the majority of major, say, aortic endovascular events, you're actually giving this patient's TXA, FFP, and platelets, cryoprecipitate, everything you can to try to make their blood thicker, so to speak. And for that reason, I do advocate removing the, sh the sheath in the OR prior to removal whenever possible and attempting to confirm perfusion distally uh, before leaving the operative theater. Many people, uh, particularly trauma surgeons in the U.S., don't feel comfortable with this per se because they're worried about hematoma and pseudoaneurysms. Even the large ones, however, on the right-hand side of this picture are not surgical emergencies if the limb is perfused. And I would take a pseudoaneurysm if they do occur, which is not very common after sheath removal and closure with either a device or being, having pressure held over the time-limiting constraints of an ischemic limb any day of the week. And the devices continue to improve. Uh, the old CODA devices were large, cumbersome. Wires could go in various places. I am a, a large fan of the uh, way that devices are improving now and continue to improve with new and novel approaches. And I think the data is pretty clear that the seven French devices do decrease, uh, resuscita uh, decrease resuscitation requirements when utilized. They may improve outcomes, but they certainly decrease distal extremity embolism rates relative to the older devices. This is just a reference article we kind of gathered several years ago, many of these steps and these thought processes about how to think about, identify, and deal with complications. And I, I do uh, offer that up for reading purposes for anyone who would like to undertake it. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to entertain questions. Okay, thank you, Joe, for that tour de force and a very good presentation, which has taken us through all the complications and ways in which we can avoid them. Members of the panel, any comments? I want to bring another respect to the topic, if I may. Uh, as all participants of this webinar uh, would accept that Rewar is a remarkably effective tool in the management of bleeding control. Uh, numerous studies are reporting that the lower rates of mortality and morbidity with, uh, in the management of severe hemorrhage with Rewar. Uh, however, there are also conflicting results 
And I believe that the complications of Reboa uh, may be a reperfusion injury, uh, may play a major role uh, in generating these controversial results. Um, as you inflate the balloon and the clock starts ticking and the race against the time begins, uh, as we all know, and when you achieve the desired level of occlusion, uh, ischemic burden distal to the balloon uh, becomes a surge and uh, an anaerobic uh, metabolites like lactate or uh, electrolytes like potassium uh, begin to accumulate in the hypoxic tissues. Uh, also, a pro-inflammatory cytokine burst occurs. Uh, so uh, when you decide that you are done with the occlusion and when you decide to deflate the balloon, uh, all these waste products and metabolites uh, enters in the uh, bloodstream in a flash and may cause the death uh, of your patient whom you uh, resuscitated and uh, managed uh, to stop uh, its bleeding, uh, the bleeding just now. So uh, I think at this point we have to uh, return to basics maybe and remember the first rule of medicine, uh, first do no harm maybe. Uh, in this context, uh, I think partial rebo uh, becomes an art of resuscitation. Uh, I have to underline this term, uh, art of resuscitation. Uh, it is an uh, uh, art because it's like walking on a fine line and balancing the uh, profits and the loss for the greater good of the patient. And it's resuscitation, uh, even in, in endovascular, uh, as an emergency physician, resuscitation is... Uh, we aim to resuscitate the brain in the first place uh, when we are performing uh, res a resuscitation. So uh, how, uh, I think uh, all these come to a problem that uh, has to be solved, uh, that uh, we have better uh, monitoring, uh, objective monitoring options, maybe, uh, because uh, are we sure that the, we are preserving the brain perfusion in its limits when we are uh, managing uh, to stop the bleeding in the liver with a uh, partial or total occlusion of the aorta. Uh, so how can we be sure uh, that uh, I have to, I need to hear uh, your opinion uh, about it. How can we bring, uh, monitor the brain? Or should we monitor the brain? Or should we... Uh, attempt to uh, monitor the uh, flow, distal flow, or rather than the pressure itself? Uh, be, uh, great questions and all very important. We need to continue to scrutinize the utilization of Reboa, in my opinion. I think um, your question about the brain uh, sequelae is important when the reperfusion sequelae. Um, I, I certainly uh, if, think we need to continue to, to explore those things uh, yeah. actively. Um, and it, those are just going to be an important part of moving forward with the, with the use of this. Uh, the flow has often discussed about, you know, should we look at flow instead of pressure? And my argument on that at present is that when you, if you look at every standard of care across the ATLS, uh, across everything that we're taught as trauma surgeons, or I have to, in, in the U.S. at least, talk to trauma surgeons, they all understand pressure, but flow rates is not something that they're used to translating in their brain in the context of a code situation. Flow, there is evidence to suggest flow may be a more important measure than actual pressure because there are different variables that are involved. But at present, I like to utilize the pressure indicators because it's something everyone in the room can understand. And this tool should never be utilized outside of a team sport environment, in my opinion, uh, in the civilian setting. Maybe uh, the individualization of partial reborn may be associated in, with better outcomes. Uh, I don't know how to individualize it, but somehow uh, may be uh, associated with lower rates of mortality and mortality. Well, we hope so. That's why I do it. Uh, but of course, that's going to need on, uh, continued study. Uh, uh, Joe, I got a question for you. I mean, like you said in your presentation, it's uh, for partial rebar, I think it's a little bit more complex and it has to be a rehearsal. Right, so uh, if we see this, the, the, the numbers, uh, most of the reboas, it's not that frequent. I mean, uh, maybe you have a higher incidence, but maybe you got one, one a month in, 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 an, in a big hospital, and most of them are in level one trauma centers. I think in the US, above 80% of the reboas are being used in level one trauma centers. So in level two, it's maybe 10%. 
So since we're seeing that this is starting to, you know, get moving and it started to be more popular, people are interested. Um, I, I think we need to find a way um, through training and simulation uh, to really have everybody prepared because especially if you want to do partial report, uh, I mean, if you're on call and your team is on call or Todd with David is on call, I think it's going to go really easy. But maybe if we have other colleagues, you know, it's not the time to have issues with these difficult cases. So do you have any simulation training models additional from the best course in your institution? I think there are a lot of different, uh, to some degree, it, it needs to be based on the institutional capabilities as well. I do encourage everybody going to take Tal's course, taking the American College Surgeon's best course, so you can talk about these things. But at the end of the day, all, all of our environments of care are different and all of our capabilities are different and all of the team compositions will be different. In the U.S., uh, we obviously, you, and, and anesthesiologists, for example, has a di very different role in the U.K. than they do uh, in, in the U.S. In some, in some ways. So I think you have to take the tools from that training, send a champion to, uh, to obtain that training to go to Tao's course, pick, pick his brain as someone who utilizes this technology on a frequent basis, and bring it back and have a, a thoughtful um, discussion with the people at your institution. Is this, A, something that is useful for our environment? And, and th I encourage you to think about it as a, a, a tool that can be utilized in a variety of different ways from not just trauma, GI bleeders, uh, obstetric, obstetric emergencies. Is it going to be required very often? No, it's not even here at shock trauma, not required very often. But when it is needed, I think what you're, what a lot of those patients at those level two hospitals just simply die. And so they, because they don't have the, these kind of options. If you have those means and you're able to see if they can adapt to your environment, at the end of the day, the answer may be no. This isn't something we can do at our institution. But if you're going to do it, obtain the training, obtain, find a champion, and do so in a very thoughtful and coordinated fashion, in my opinion. Thanks. Could I just uh, one quick point with regards to that? I think, uh, Joe, fantastic talk. Just going back to one of your early slides, it actually stated that the time for you to actually keep the Zone 1 Reboa deployed was eight minutes, which I think is one of the key imperatives of where you're working. It is a bridge to definitive control. And that time frame, just to keep that balloon inflated for just under 10 minutes, it's like cross-clamping the descending thoracic yard, and you're taking the clamp off very, very quickly after that. You've gone to partial Reboa in under 10 minutes. So your toxic metabolite, your reperfusion injury is mitigated to a certain level. That is the key thing. You don't deploy a Reboa balloon to be up there for an hour, 90 minutes, because you're great. You're alive above the balloon, but you're dead below it. And I think that is one of the key things with this. It is a tool, but is a tool to definitive control. And I think the great paradox here is that introducing Reboa as a tool to the environment that has done a couple of things that I think are side effects that are wonderful. One, early femoral continuous monitoring, instead of waiting for the blood pressure cuff to go off every five minutes. Mm -hmm. I find that now that we've gotten earlier common femoral artery utilization and continuous monitoring, I use Reboa less because we now identify those patients who decompensate instead of waiting till the blood pressure cuff goes off the next three minutes and finally find their blood pressure is exceedingly low and they're moving the wrong direction. Um, and I, I think the other thing is that we're going to get smarter about resuscitative adjuncts that we utilize. We already know calcium plays a big role with uh, Reboa utilization. If you try to do animal models with, without giving calcium after hemorrhage and Reboa utilization, a towel can tell you the animal dies. So it's incorporated into just about all the animal models, and I found that to be the case in actual human practice, although it's a little harder to study in that context. But the other change is we're going to start stealing things back from the cardiac, cardiothoracic surgeons and open abdominal surgery where patients had prolonged clamps on and the anesthesiologist had those little cocktails they were injecting to mitigate the risk of a reperfusion injury in the washout. And I think we need to come back to that, those kind of adjuncts. That's an interesting uh, debate or an interesting topic for, for, for a very long webinar, I think. Um, but the important thing now is to get back onto the team approach, which I think is the main part of Carlos's uh, presentation. So, Carlos, if you'd like to uh, share yes. the screen, yes, sure, we can uh, move. We can okay. move on with that. All right. All right. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the panelists and and all the. The people are attending this webinar and 
also Estes for the opportunity to speak about uh, REVOA and EBT and educational programs and why we say that it's just more than technical skills. So uh, I have no financial disclosures. Uh, when we talk about learning theories and principles in surgical education and, and technical learning, it's a complex process for these type of, of technology. You have to uh, use uh, behavioral aspects, uh, personal aspects of confidence, but especially environmental issues are, are very important. You have to address supportive needs like simulation, training, mentorship, quality communication and stress management uh, so you can conquer uh, and establish a well-developed and mature program. And it's easier said than done, really. So uh, the American College of Surgeons did a follow-up of the original paper in 2018, uh, 2019 joint statement uh, by the uh, Committee of Trauma and several emergency physician and technician associations where they addressed the guidelines for this. And it's basically what they they set forward and highlight is it said it's a team approach and that all the members of the team need to be familiar with Reboa across a continuum of care from the emergency department through the intensive care unit. I would even say that even from the pre-hospital setting in some places to all the way to the intensive care unit. So when we speak specifically about the training, uh, it's, it's important to highlight that all the members have to receive this training so we can be on the same page. Uh, it's also very important that you receive didactic and hands-on skills training uh, for all aspects of the procedure, not only putting on the catheter, but monitoring it, trying to reduce complications, and also to remove it as quickly as possible, to make it as safe as possible. Uh, and so for this, it's very important to have high fidelity simulation, use perfuse catheter, or even better, live tissue training uh, and I, I think the ideal thing is to focus your, your training in ultrasound-guided uh, percutaneous access, uh, also be able to perform a uh, training of cutdowns if needed, and, and you have to be very familiar with your material in your hospital or in your area, uh, the, the sheets, the, gu the, the guide wires, and um, appropriate positioning of the catheter. Maybe you have ultrasound, you could also do it by ultrasound or conventional radiology and also manage the volumes of inflation. And remember that as a clamp that you have to walk them, uh, the catheters also can move. And like, like uh, Joe said, sometimes it can end up in the wrong place. So you have to be aware of this and, and uh, be prepared. So as we mentioned before, um, the, the trauma systems around the world uh, and the, even trauma centers in, in, a, in the United States or in Europe are different one from another. So it's not a one size fits all uh, a training program that we have to push forward. And uh, the American College of Surgeons with their best course uh, on both modalities, I think the best course and, and the best workshop are, 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 have had established a successful program for the start, at least in, in the US with clear learning objectives that it's clear indication for Reboa use, uh, access and closure of the common femoral artery techniques and potential complications, what are the tools that are gonna be required for, for the Reboa and, and the technique. So I think this is a great program. It started in the US. Uh, it's expanded uh, also in Latin America. I know Carlos Ordonez has a lot of experience and his and his team in, in Colombia and they're also, uh, doing uh, the best course and with, with some success. And uh, last year also Gustavo Fraga, Marcelo Ribeiro and Bruno Pereira in, in Brazil organized a wonderful meeting uh, focused also on damage control resuscitation and, and Reboa. So we can see this is growing internationally. Uh, in Europe, it's, it's a little bit different. I think we have a standard and the standard is, is the Orebro University Hospital Workshop. It's done a great job. And I think one of the differences is that uh, the, the best program is more focused on the Reboa per se. Uh, instead, the EVTM workshop, it's more like an EVTM philosophy where the Reboa is only a part of the, of the toolbox and you can have other elements uh, like a dedicated CT protocol and hybrid uh, mindset, a hybrid tool set. So it's a two-day course with a lot of international faculty, 
uh, a lot of lectures, but of course, what's most important uh, it's the hands-on training, uh, and he's combined the three training models. Uh, it has training models, cadaver lab, animal lab, and at the end of the second day, we do just, you know, scatter around in groups and small groups. I think that's also very important, uh, supervised and, and mentored. Uh, with experts leading and doing real clinical cases, not only in Reboa, but in, in the whole uh, EVTM philosophy. So this, this model is also being uh, uh, pushed forward in, in other places in, in Europe. I know Yunus in Turkey has done three courses and is also uh, developing ECMO technology in, in, in his country. Uh, and in Spain, we're, we're building the system, at least in Zaragoza, I know in, in Madrid, it's a bit different and in Barcelona, but in Saragossa, we're trying to build it from the bottom up. So we have two programs that go simultaneously. One is an advanced resuscitation for massive hemorrhage with all the blood components and endovascular control. And, and the other is a, a hybrid uh, um, endovascular and open surgical vascular techniques. And these are available uh, not only for vascular surgeons, we don't have trauma surgeons as such, so it's more like a general surgeon's program that we develop in the SIVA. That's our, our research uh, surgical uh, unit, uh, and we have uh, participation with several several members of the several hospitals. Uh, just prior to the lockdown, we had also the opportunity to organize with uh, uh, my friends Pablo Tolino and Juan Pablo Ramos in Chile their first EVTM Revoa workshop. So the idea is to it's very different from one place to another. And there are a lot of differences in, in countries and, and systems, but walking around and seeing different courses and different places, I think it's very important, this paper that came out in, in the last journal of EVTM, uh, where it highlights the importance that it's not just teaching a technique or the teaching a program. Uh, if you want to really successfully implement Reboa in your institution, I think you have to address the system. You have to really uh, try to work the things from the bottom up uh, to have a stable system and then uh, be able to uh, uh, work uh, with uh, more complex scenarios and, and work properly. And you should be able to, to not only expect, but also avoid and manage complications because the idea is to make this as, as safe as possible for your patient and not to add additional morbidity. So uh, hum with all the humility, I would say that for me, the key elements of our, our starting program, I mean, it's, it's, it's starting is that before you introduce the program, you have to consider what are your, your trauma center uh, and trauma system capabilities and limitations. So you have to be honest with yourself. And then with hard work and institutional support, a lot of teamwork, skills, and competence, cooperation and leadership, but really important also the funding and the high level of motivation. If you get all this, you get the right people on the bus, you may have uh, a good program running. And, and last uh, but not least, I want to congratulate Estes and uh, EVTM for pushing forward uh, virtual learning in times of COVID. Uh, all the panelists and all the people have made this possible. I think it's really important. It's a new reality. So we're going to have to get used to this. I hope that soon we can get back to uh, seeing each other in, in webinars and workshops. But for now, uh, this is a great opportunity to keep this uh, growing and keep teaching and, and learning from all the experts around the world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. I think this would be a good time actually to ask the audience um, how many of those, how many actually use Reboa, how many are planning to introduce Reboa, and how many have absolutely no plans whatsoever to go anywhere near Reboa. So uh, let's see what you think. Okay, so 
About 71% of the audience, well, 30% have no plans to use Reboa, but the other 70% either use it or are planning to introduce it. So they should have, find, should have found that quite a useful, uh, useful talk. Uh, panelists, any comments there on uh, Carlos's uh, presentation and the importance of team working, which is something which has been emphasized, I think, by everybody? Tell you look like you're about yeah. to say something. Yeah, sorry, just one comment. We've been checking about how much Reboa we're using and it's done in the concept. Our rate is around 15 per year. So it's not a huge, uh, huge uh, volume that we use this and might, maybe we're using a bit more in a situation, for example, that maybe in London you would be quicker. Eight minutes to operate laparotomy does not exist in my hands. So. Uh, of course, it's other issues how it can help you, but as Carlos says, it's part of the concept and that's why we're being called to the gynecology yesterday in the evening uh, or other cases to the orthopedic, you can help on iatrogenic injuries. When you get a concept and when you get a tool, you can use it for different things. And I think if you combine with people, you, you, with your cardiologist, when they get the wrong puncture, you will find this not only for trauma, but also for acute surgical care, gynecology. And you can find yourself using it in more things uh, due to the cooperation and the structure that, that Carlos mentioned. And I think this is the great thing to a vascular surgeon, IR, ICU, a trauma surgeon, et cetera, et cetera, together. So, so I think it goes beyond trauma. It goes beyond just, and probably beyond only bleeders, more to more the resuscitation. And we've been using it, for example, as bridge to ECMO. And I think there is a lot to study on this. So if, if you use this tool for one thing, it might be useful on the correct patient to something else in, in the right platform. Following on from that, if you're not seeing a lot of Reboa use within your hospital, how do you maintain the skills within that team that you've set up in order to use it properly? Specifically at our place with vascular and endovascular surgeons. So you use this method. We use a balloon in elective cases once in two weeks. So this is not the issue. I think the major issue is the access multidisciplinary team. I have cases, David was with me, that a cardiologist or anesthesiologist did better the access then I did it. He was fast, he was number one, he succeeded, I failed, great. So you have people around in London, Barcelona, in Brazil, you have people that can do things. It doesn't have to be you, uh, it, it has to be a team. Uh, I know my colleagues in Israel, for example, one of the centers there, they're using, it's an interventional radiologist that comes in and helps them in the, specifically in the access. So it depends, as Joe mentioned also, the, how, you, how you do, in your center, and then you can maintain your skills. Okay, if nobody else has any comments, then I think we will draw it to a close at this point. I think it's been a fantastic webinar. Um, and I hope that it's been very useful to uh, everybody who's taken part, either through asking questions, through viewing or through discussing. Um, we've had a fantastic backstage crew without whom this would not have been possible. So I'd like to take the opportunity to thank my good friends, Alan Bilislavo, Diego Mariani, Haita Carriara and Mauro Zago, uh, who will work behind the scenes. I'm grateful to our contributors, David McCreevy, Mansur Khan, Tal Hora, Joe Dubose, Stefan Lechtel, uh, Offa Galili, Janos Osloa, Marcel Rabiera, and to my co-host, who's put a lot of work and effort into this, Carlos Janos. Thank you for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed this webinar and will join us again in two weeks time for an Estes webinar on acute cholecystitis in the elderly and in four weeks time for a webinar on humeral fractures in the elderly. And after that, I'm sure we'll get back to some trauma in younger people. Details of future webinars can be found on the events page of the West Estes website at estesonline.org. Hope to see you then. And uh, we'll just say goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank you.